Luciano started that era where he partnered with Mylanski from the Jews. He partnered with Bumpy Johnson in Harlem. And he was close friends with all of them. And now they have that Gangster of Harlem show where they try to say, oh, the Italians are racist. They couldn't get along with Bumpy Johnson. Bumpy Johnson's wife, his own wife, go out there and read the memoir. It's a great memoir. His own wife wrote a memoir. And she said that Lucky Luciano was one of my husband's absolute truest friends. And I quote it in the book. That's coming from Bumpy Johnson's wife. You could take all that Hollywood crap and flush it down the toilet bowl because it ain't true. Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today I'm joined by a returning guest. He is a former mobster and his name is Louis Ferrante. Louis was an associate of the Gambino crime family. Louis was also deeply involved with the mafia life. He was doing hijackings, robberies, and many more crimes. This is the second interview I did with Louis. Our previous interview, we got a lot of great feedback, so I thought, hey, you know what? We need to bring him on and talk about another topic. So today we talk about his new book series, and the name of his new book that just came out is called Brigada. Lewis breaks down the very early history of the Mafia. He brings up so much new information that I haven't heard been covered by other Mafia historians. Lewis has so many books, and I will put his new one in the video description below. I highly recommend it. He was so deeply involved in the Mafia life, so he has all, all kinds of first-hand information. He's also got a really great redemption story that we get into today. Please subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Lewis's story. All right, and we're back for part two, Lou. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast this afternoon again. I really liked the part one we did, and now this is part two, man. We got a lot of good reaction, a lot of feedbacks from it, so I thought it was only right to bring you back on, man. So thank you for coming on. Same, same here. Thanks for having me. And uh, you said you'd read the book, and you did, and and uh, I'm so glad you really enjoyed it. Great, yeah. great to hear. And I mean, anybody that likes mafia history or wants to learn more about it, man, Lou is the guy to read the book. He's full of information. He put in seven years into this three-part series. The only the first one's out right now, but he's, he's, he's put in a number of years of, man. So what, what was that like putting in all that work? Like, what did that really look like for you? It was exhausting. Um, okay. I, yeah, I grew up when I, when I was younger, I had no patience. And even till I was, even till not long ago, I didn't have any patience, but I did, I did learn a lot more patience in prison, believe it or not, in jail. When I was sitting in a prison cell and you're locked in there and there's nowhere you could go and all you have is either you idle away the time or you read and make something of yourself. That's when I really learned patience. I read 18 hours a day. Um, I would stay, sometimes I'd stay in my cell all day. If it was nice out, I went to the yard, took a book, uh, brought a book with me. Uh, and then I became such an avid reader that I'd be carrying a book everywhere, even in and out of the chow hall. Um, you know, I was always reading while I was eating, while I was eating lunch, while I was eating dinner. Um, but I learned patience in a prison cell. And I, I would consider this, this whole odyssey of writing this trilogy was just a test in patience that I already established when I was in jail. So I was able to sort of glue myself to a desk for the seven years, block out of my mind, all type of like social, uh, um, you know, for the most part, social enticements, I would say, you know, you always want to go out here, you want to do this, you want to do that. And I would have to constantly say to myself, no, I need to work. I need to keep my nose in the book. I need to get this done. Um, I need to keep going with my research. And I would spend, sometimes I'd go down a rabbit hole and spend an entire day searching for articles from the 1800s for the first book, let's say, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, so that took a lot of patience. And then I'd be back to my desk then writing the next day and all of the distractions I would have to block out. And I think that's sort of like something I learned when I was in prison. Um, I, I remember when I was in jail once, I, everybody used to get bent out of shape when there was a lockdown because um, you were locked in your cell. They wouldn't let you out. If there was a fight, let's say, or somebody got stabbed, they would do a lockdown and you weren't allowed out of your cell. And everybody gets all bent. Everybody's screaming, pulling at the bars, yelling. It becomes sort of like a zoo in there. And at some point, and we, we, we become inhumane. We become like animals because of all of that. And we're acting like animals. And at some point or another, because I had taught myself patience and I had become such an avid reader that if there was a lockdown, I didn't even realize it. I didn't even care. It didn't matter to me. I'm like, okay, so what? We're locked down a month, big deal. As long as I got my books, I don't care. Um, so when COVID came during, during while I was writing this book, these books, um, people were complaining to me going, oh man, the lockdowns, the lockdowns. I'm like, I've been locked down for five years already. 
You know, it's just another couple before I'm, you know, I'm done with this. So what's the difference? So it was sort of like a different mindset that you have. You could convince yourself anything. And to a certain degree, I did convince myself while I was in jail that the the isolation was a good thing, but it served me when I became a writer because I'm able to just glue myself to a desk and, and sit there for however long it takes. Yeah. And I mean, really just that escape, you use that escape to escape prison by taking your mind somewhere else and getting involved with these books and stuff. So mm -hmm. you were able to factor that into you writing this book. So when it mm -hmm. came about writing this book, like how did, how did this whole deal come about? I was, I was invited to Sicily by the, the media conglomerate, Axel Springer, a German media conglomerate. And they invited me to Sicily for a retreat for their editors. They were having a, a retreat in Agrigento, Sicily. And they said, look, we'll fly you in, um, pick you up from the airport, put you in the presidential suite. And it was an offer I couldn't refuse. So I went, not knowing that it would be it would morph into this book deal. I had no idea. They sat me next to um, a gentleman by the name of George. And he, he and I hit it off. We talked about history from the beginning of time throughout uh, you know, the Middle Ages, um, the Reformation, the Renaissance, um, up until the 20th century when he told me he had fled Austria with 16 shillings in his pocket when the Wehrmacht roll, rolled in, the Nazis, the, the German army. And I said, you're kidding me, you, you fled the Holocaust? And he said, I did. And he said that um, he had lost his grandmothers in the Holocaust, but he got out in time, went to, went to Great Britain, went to England, London, and uh, he became a publisher. And he said, I want to publish your next book. And the next day, him and his his lovely wife, Lady Annabelle, we had lunch overlooking the ruins in Agrigento. And we we sort of like fleshed out what the book would be about. And um, they, they pretty much convinced me because I wasn't sure I wanted to write a history of the Italian American mafia. And um, they had a they went a long way in convincing me that I was the perfect person to write it, given my experiences. Um, and it, it as it turned out, from what I'm from what I'm the feedback I'm getting from around the world as of this moment, it seems like I was the right person. So I'm, I'm happy to say that. I would for sure agree with that because like I, I told you, I read the book front to back, man. I thought it was incredible. And like you, I could tell you really did your research and just like how you explained it, like you would sit down for days and, and days and then you would go and write just making sure your information is credible as much as it can be. And the way that you depicted it, it really was. And like, I could, understand your book so much more and i was able to piece to piece like everything how how the sicilian culture really influenced the mob in new york and all the other families and how they came to the u.s and like it just really makes more sense instead of like gapping the periods like some books are because we don't have the history or you know maybe there's articles and stuff but they're not really publicized but somehow you you were able to find them yeah th thanks for pointing that out it's so true adrian when i was doing my research, I'd read a lot of different mob books. And time and again, I would I would see, well, the mafia started in Sicily, and then they'd move on to the stories we're familiar with, Lucky Luciano, Mylansky, mm -hmm. Albert Anastasia, et cetera. Or sometimes they would say, well, it stemmed from sort of feudalism, and then that would be it. And they'd move on a word or two about feudalism, and then they move on to the stories we're familiar with time and again. And I became very frustrated by, by that because I said, as a reader, I want to know where something came from, the genesis of something. And I would be frustrated if someone wrote a book about the Roman Empire and said, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar didn't start the Roman Empire. When did it start? Let's go back to the original people. Let's go back to, you know, the city on the hill and 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 learn how they ended up in Rome, how how people migrated and where they came from and how the culture developed and how the army was eventually formed. And that's the stuff that interests me. So I wanted to do that as a writer. I wanted to fulfill that need that I would have as a reader and give the readers that sort of backstory. And instead of just touching upon it and saying, uh, this is how it all began. And now we move on to Lucky Luciano or somebody else. Uh, I wanted to go deep into how it really formed inside the Sicilian womb over the course of centuries. And I dug deep. I My initial research, I probably spent over a year just studying feudalism. And how the feudalism developed and had an impact on the different peoples of Europe slash Sicily. And that sort of like was how I began to realize how close the mafia is to this day to a feudal society. And then I wanted to also point out, so I don't just tell the reader, but I want to show the reader 
I pointed out time and, time and again, direct correlations between feudal society and a, a modern day mafia family and how uh, a feudal lord and his relationship with his vassals is identical to a mafia don and his relationship to his soldiers and so on and so on. And, and uh, when I finally came out of it, I'm like, okay, I have all of this sort of like academic stuff. And then we get into the blood and guts, obviously, you know, I go right where everyone else goes to right. with extra added insights um, that I was able to bring to the, to, to the table. But at some point or another, I looked back and I said, you know, I was tossed. Will everybody be interested in this? And there are a few people maybe who won't, but for the most part, most people, the majority have given me tremendous feedback once again, too, about that saying, finally, I see how the mafia developed. Finally, I understand how it came about. And that's something no one ever explained to me. And I think I'm the first person to, to, to have ever done that. And I think the reason is, is because I sort of detached myself from the mafia stories we all know at first and dug deep into that. And then I come back around to those stories later. Right. And see, that's what I'm saying. Like that was new to me. So I never really heard that part of it. So the, the way you kind of labeled in the book was like the Sicilian culture mm -hmm. and then where the mafia came from, because it went to just way back to the whole Sicilian culture. And you went into a lot of detail about how they mm -hmm. were and how they were different mm -hmm. and how they kind of adapted over time. And mm -hmm. you just the way that you were able to explain it was just was pretty incredible because to find that information, to spend a year on all that, 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 that is a lot of dedication and work and to be able to actually understand it though, because we need to, because it, that, that's what makes it different. Like I said, because we don't hear that, that whole thing is usually, like you said, Lucky Luciano, but when, in your book, Lucky Luciano didn't really come into like a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but that's the guy that we know who brought, mm -hmm. that's who we, we always are aware of that came mm -hmm. over on the boat and, mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever it may have been, but mm -hmm. And we hear like how he started this big organization and all the other key players and stuff, mm -hmm. but we don't hear the beginning stuff. So that's why I thought that was a good point to bring up and that you put in your book. So like to go on to the next topic, like what was your, you, you had a chapter kind of dedicated to where the mafia came from. You, you talked about multiple different kind of names and mm -hmm. where it could have uh, came from and which one do you kind of believe that? Oh, which one do you go yeah, with? that's another great question. Um, when, no one really knows where the word mafia came from and everyone, and it's, it's a word we should want to know its origin because the word mafia is like so often used across the globe. Now the Russian mafia, the Armenian mafia, the Albanian mafia, uh, the Bulgarian mafia, the Irish mafia, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. But they're really, it all comes from the Sicilian mafia. That's where it all came from that whole word. Where did, so where did it come from? within Sicilian society. I really desperately wanted to know myself. And what I found was there was a tremendous Arab influence in Western Sicily at one point. And the Arabs, uh, the Arab Berbers, which are Arabs from North Africa, they were really, really anti-institution, anti-government, anti-authority. And they were pushed into the sort of Western region of Sicily. And I feel the mafia's founding fathers are of Arab dash Sicilian origin. That's what I came to the conclusion that these Arabs who eventually obviously became Sicilians over the course of centuries, those sort of uh, Sicilians with Arabs, Arab blood became the original mafiosos. And the word mafia, all historians pretty much agree for the most part that the word comes from Arab origin. A lot of people say mafaz, mafe, different Arab words that stem from like a cave, a proud horse, which would interpret to become a proud young man who's a mafioso. And all of these Arab words that sort of go into it are a little distant to me. They weren't over the target. They were sort of like out there, but they gave me the clue that I should look deep into Arab words and culture. So eventually I came up with the, um, the, uh, the uh, etymological root word for mafia being there was, and, and I came up with tremendous amounts of evidence to prove it in the book, as you, as you know, but there was during the, most of us are familiar, a lot of us who study history are familiar with the siege of Khartoum when General Gordon Pasha uh, of the, of the great, of Great Britain was trying to hold off Khartoum from a siege of Arab, uh, uh, an Arab army 
headed by a Muhammad Ahmad, who was the self-proclaimed Mahdi. And the Mahdi was supposed to be somebody who was a direct descendant of Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad. And the Mahdi sort of creeps up throughout history time and time again, whenever the Arabs feel they're being oppressed. And when the Arabs, the Arab Berbers of Western Sicily felt that Italy proper was oppressing them and that they weren't, didn't have a chance of survival without, unless they banded together and defended themselves, they sort of became sort of like what the modest regime would be. The Mahdi's army was the modest regime. And the modest regime was, the word for that was the Madia. And the Madia is one letter away from mafia. And I believe that that was the root word for the word mafia. I believe that these Arab Berbers of Western Sicily who banded together to protect themselves and the people from the overarching authority from Rome in, in Italy, uh, originally Turin, but in Rome when Italy was unified and they started to push up against Sicily, even though they sucked, they absorbed Sicily into the Italian unification. The Sicilians weren't happy with it. And the Arab Berbers were really, really pissed about it. And I believe that's the word. And I use, and I don't just go on a whim and say, you know, and and obviously in this broadcast, we have very limited time to get deep into it. But if you read the book, you'll see, I don't just say, say, this is what I think. I I use tremendous pieces of evidence, evidence from authorities that brings us back to that word as the origin of the mafia. And, uh, and I think, you know, I look, I leave it for future historians to debate, to add to it, to take away from it, whatever they want to do. But I was fairly convinced when I walked away. I was absolutely convinced, actually, when I walked away from it, that that's the root word for the word mafia. Um, I could I could see that in the way that you described it in the book. Like I said, we'll, we'll put that in the video description for people to check out. Mm-hmm. He really goes into detail and he has supporting evidence to where he we got this information. So check it out. And we'll, we'll, we'll now we'll go focus in on a little bit on the corruption because the corruption over there, that's where it all started. And so when we see it come over here as well, like, of course there's corruption everywhere, but I mean, that's where they kind of, uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know. How how would you explain it? Like they kind of got their, their ways of corruption. Like Mm -hmm. they knew how to break people or they knew how to get people on the payroll kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned that in the book and that was another key point. Sicily in from the unification of Italy in 1860s until the massive immigrant wave of Southern Italians, which included the Sicilians to America. That time period, we we saw the most corruption ever in Sicily. And Sicily was very, it was a corrupt state and everything was done. Now, having said that, they weren't aware that they were corrupt because it's almost like Herodotus pointed out when he wrote his histories, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, um, he pointed out that what's What's normal in your society may be very different in my society. And, you know, every society is different. For example, things that we think uh, now pot was against the law for forever in, right. in the United States. It was illegal to, to distribute marijuana. I have friends that served 20, 30 years for distributing truckloads of marijuana. And now that same sentences they say are served, those same sentences they served wouldn't even be on the law books now in many states where it's legal. So you could see just in one country how things change in just a small time period. Um, So that said, uh, there were people in Sicily who did not feel that their way of life was corrupt. But the people of Europe and Italy proper was part of Western Europe. They looked in at Sicily and said, you people are corrupt. Everything you do is corrupt. And they said, no, no, this is how we do things. We don't have laws on the books. We take care of things. The little the little old man in the piazza named Vito, you go see him if you have a problem. If your daughter wants to marry this other guy or the other guy wants to marry your daughter, you go see Vito. And who's Vito? Well, Vito's 79 years old and he's been around forever. So, you know, we answer to him. What do you mean? You're not allowed to answer to Vito. You have to answer to the courts. You're not, well, what, what happens when the house is robbed? We go see Vito. What do you mean you go see Vito? Vito tells the crook. He finds the crook and he tells the crook, you put back the stuff or you lose your face or you lose your, we cut your balls off, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, that this was law to them. This was their way of life. And then when Italy proper said, hey, you're not allowed to live that way. You have to live by our standards. Italy, uh, Sicily pushed back and said, no. 
No, that's not, we're not going to listen to some, some smart Alex from, from the law courts in, in, on the peninsula, on the continent, the peninsula of Italy slash the continent of Europe who make, make up laws who we've never even known or heard from. We don't know them. They're not going to tell us our laws. Some, some little shit ass who went to a big school in, in Milan is going to write up a few laws and tell us how to live our lives. No, we listen to Vito. That's who tells us how to live our lives. And we're comfortable with that. So all of that, and I'm giving you obviously, you know, the very dumbed down version of it. Right. You'll see in the book, it's more academically, you know, I, I'm a little easier when I tease it out. Uh, I, you know, it's a little easier to understand. And, you know, I, I think. I most, is. I'm falling. Yeah. 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 But, you know, you, you get the drift. So right. they sort of that corrupt attitude, that corrupt sort of mindset. When those Sicilians came to America, they felt discriminated against in America and they stuck together for the most part. And they carried that mindset with them that we do things our own way. We don't listen to the authorities. And if they saw somebody in a blue uniform, you know, who's a policeman twirling a baton with a gold, you know, with a silver badge to them, he's sort of the enemy because we had that in Sicily. The people in Italy told us we have to listen to those people. We didn't want to listen to them in Sicily. We don't want to listen to them in America either. So, you know, then there were obviously I make the I make a strong argument in favor of the hardworking Sicilians who did adapt immediately to American society. They only wanted to pour their blood, sweat and tears out to make a better life for themselves and their children. They had nothing to do with the mafia. There were 99.9 percent of the Sicilians who migrated to the United States were those hardworking people who had nothing to do with the mafia. You know, I want to just make sure that people who have relatives who came don't think that I'm disparaging their relatives. These were mafiosos who were a small section who came and brought with them that corruption. But even the law-abiding Sicilians did bring the mindset that I don't know nothing. You know, if you tell me something happened on my street corner, you say I was on my porch, I should have seen it. I must have been looking left or right, or maybe I was looking down or up, but I didn't see it. So they had that with them. They carried that with them no matter what, even the law-abiding Sicilians. They knew to keep their mouths shut. It's sort of like one of the aspects of omerta. A lot of people say omerta is the code of silence, but I go deep into the word omerta. It means a lot more than just the code of silence. But the Sicilians who even were law-abiding did bring that sort of like that understanding with them. They weren't going to rat on their own kind. Um, So that helped the mafiosos when they were trying to do things in their own neighborhoods, in their own places, you know, if they wanted to take over the waterfront, the reason why the mafiosos were able to take over the waterfront was because all of the hardworking Italian labor on the waterfront allowed them to mobilize them into a sort of a union force and, and, uh, and then a voting block, et cetera. And they were able to sort of like, once you mobilize the hardworking Italians, the mafioso then has power. Right. And see, so that's how they really got their way in. So we're kind of at the point in the book where they're coming over from Italy, Sicily. What, what is the difference, I suppose, like between Italy and Sicily? Because in your book, you made it a pretty key point. I mean, they're both from Italy, right? It's yeah, the, same, well, the same country. Yeah, yes, yes and no. So Sicily was conquered by different peoples throughout history. Um, the, the Romans, the Greeks, the Vandals, uh, the French, the Spanish, the Arabs. Um, everybody has been in and out of Sicily. And they had the unfortunate luck of being this beautiful island that lay at sort of like the crossroads between Europe and, and, and Africa. And, you know, it was, it was, it was tough being Sicilian throughout the ages. You always had people coming and going. And um, so the Sicilian people, if you were asked, my father's family is from Bari, Italy. Both my grandparents on his side came from Southern Italy, Bari. My mother's father is from Naples and my mother's mother is from Sicily. Now, if you ask, if you said to my mother's father or my father's parents, are you Italian? They would say, yes, we're Italian. If you said to my grandmother who was born in Sicily, are you Italian? She would say, no, I'm Sicilian. Don't call me Italian. I'm Sicilian. So she's very proud. And this is, I'm talking about my generation, me growing up. My grandmother would say this going back 1980s. You know, this is when my grandmother would say, I'm, I'm, I'm Sicilian, not Italian. So what's the difference? As you said, the difference is that When Italy became unified, because Italy was sort of like made up of all these different city-states, Florence, Milan, Venice, all these different city-states up and down the peninsula of Italy, the boot, 
they sort of like were in competition with each other throughout the ages. And around the same time, like Europe experienced this sort of like this unification trend where, you know, Bismarck unified Germany. The different places in Germany were unified under Bismarck. Bismarck was the leader of Germany at the time. And Italy did the same thing under Mazzini and Cavour. They, they sort of unified Italy. And, they, and Garibaldi was the military leader then who, who kicked the French and the Austrians out of Italy so that the city-states could become one. And he unified Italy. Well, when that happened, Sicily was told, well, if you fight for Garibaldi's cause and you help us to kick the French and the Austrians out and unify Italy, you'll get your independence. So Sicily said, sure, let's do it. We don't want anybody pushing us around anymore. We'll have our independence. After they won, Italy proper told the Sicilians, well, you know, we told you to get independence, but let's forget that idea. You're part of Italy now. And they said, no, we don't want to be part of Italy. No, you're part of Italy. Man, we don't want to be part of Italy. Well, now we'll do a vote. So a lot of people said that they did this, this plebiscite, this vote where people would vote if they wanted or not to be part of Italy. And a lot of Sicilians walked away from that feeling like the vote was fixed, that they really, they didn't want to be part of Italy, but they were forced into it. And the proof that the vote may have been fixed is in the pudding because throughout the, the, the decades, Sicilians never wanted to be part of Italy and they pushed back against everything the Italian government originally in Turin, eventually in Rome, based in Rome, tried to push on them. So for example, conscription, you have to join the military, you have to fight for Italian causes. We don't want to fight for Italian causes. Italian men just only fight for their families, a Sicilian men rather. What now we have to fight because Italy got into a beef with Austria? I don't want to go to war and, 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 uh, and mothers are going, I don't want my son to die on a battlefield, you know, uh, uh, in, in some faraway place where it has nothing to do with me and my family. So the Sicilians were totally against it. And then taxes, they're getting taxed uh, uh, from Italy. So you have to pay your taxes. We don't want to pay taxes. We pay local taxes and we, we get what we want out of it. We don't want some big government in Rome telling us how much we have to pay and then using our money for expenditures that have nothing to do to benefit us. So they constantly pushed back. So Sicily was always sort of different from Italian. And uh, once again, my grandmother would have been the first to tell you, I am not Italian. I'm, Cis I'm Sicilian. She would correct me if I said it. And she actually, the dialects were so different that my father, who spoke Barese, Baresi, my grandfather, who spoke Navalidan, Neapolitan, and my grandmother, who spoke a dialect of Sicilian, they could barely communicate with each other in those languages. They all spoke in English because the dialects are so different. Um, so that's sort of, I mean, they could communicate, but there were a lot of different words, a lot of different phrases, a lot of different expressions. It was easier to communicate in English for them than, th than their own dialects. Um, so things that, you know, that's something that I go through in the book that most people don't understand. I make a point that uh, I wrote in one, of, in one of the uh, footnotes, I think, Italy is only Italy to the tourist. Italians see Italy very differently than tourists do. And Italian-Americans, myself, you know, when I was a kid, I experienced it too. Where you were from in Italy meant a lot. If you met somebody who was Calabrese, he says, where are you from? I'm from, uh, and I tell him who, where I was from. You know, if you're not from, you know, Calabria, they don't feel like you're their brother. So there's, you know, it's a little different. Or, or sometimes you do get Italians who are just happy you're from Italy, you know, so or Sicily. But it depends. So that's sort of like I wanted to point that out in the book because when the Sicilian mafioso started in America, you had a lot of people who eventually they started to take different places, you know, other people from different parts of Italy into the mafia. But originally they just wanted it to be all Sicilian. We don't trust anybody else. We just want Sicilians in the mafia. And then slowly but surely, during the Castel, the Castel Malarisi War, the Sicilians said, gee, we need people to fight our wars. You know, so it's sort of like how maybe big nations conscript people from other nations, you know, who just came in, new migrants. Okay, join the army. We could use you. From the Roman army up, you know, the Romans did it. All the way up and through present time, you know, people do it. So the Sicilians did it too. You know, here we are fighting a war. We can't, we can't even surprise each other on the street, one mafioso said. Because we all know each other. We all know each other from Sicily. But if we get a guy from maybe, uh, um, you know, the Campania region of, 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 uh, of Italy or somebody from, uh, you know, wherever, bring him over here and let him shoot somebody who you could surprise. They don't know him. So they sort of like started using these people as soldiers during the war. So it was interesting. I go through that in the book, too. 
Well, yeah, I think that was, I appreciate you breaking that down for me because I've always heard that throughout mob books and stuff like that, but I just never went into depth or really understood it like that. So that makes sense now. So anybody watch it. Yeah. I hope that if you ever had that same question, I hope that clears it up for you, but they did. I understand it more now how, so now we're kind of at the point to where they're here. They come into the United States. They're going to different states and a lot of them end up in, on the East coast, New York and stuff, but they, they do go, they spread out too. Well, I think actually from your book, they started in New Orleans, right? That's, that, that's was where the, they that was the mafia's Plymouth rock. So be, me being a former New York mob guy, I, I always thought everything happened in New York. I was always, I was convinced that, you know, the five major mafia families are in New York. They had the most seats on the commission. They controlled most of the country. They were sort of like the Rome of the Roman empire you know, the, the, the New York was, I thought always. And what I learned was when the Sicilians and the Southern Italians first came to America, they were looking for a place that was sort of similar to their own climate. If you leave the Mediterranean and you end up in New York where there's nine feet of snow this winter, I mean, you know, these people never saw snowstorms. and now they're freezing their asses off, chopping wood, putting it on the fire, you know, shaking like leaves all winter because they're freezing their asses off, making chicken soup, something they never had before. You know, it's like, wait, we could just live in Louisiana where there's a lot of work too. Because what happened was in the 1860s, the United States abolished the horrid institution of slavery. So once we got rid of slavery, America needed now cheap labor to replace slave labor. So who are we going to use for cheap labor? We need somebody to work the corn, you know, the cotton fields. We need somebody to work the tobacco fields. Who are we going to hire? All of these Southern Italians who were considered back then, because they were darker than white, they were considered sort of like, they were called pizza ends. They were called ends turned inside out. They had all these derogatory names that attribute, you know, that, that, uh, uh, compared them to African Americans, so they said, "Well, you know what? We could use these these Sicilian Americans and and uh, Southern Italians, being from like mostly Naples, and take them, and put them in Calabria, and take them and put them on the fields to work and work the fields for us, like the African Americans once did, and we'll pay them hardly anything. So although we'd rather pay nothing to them, like we did to the African Americans, we never paid them anything for." I don't know how many centuries, right? Since the 16, 14, 1500, 1600s, uh, when the first slave ship came. But we'll just pay them cheap. So the Italians, though, didn't care that they were going to be paid cheap. They just wanted work. So they came, and Sicilians, and they came to Louisiana looking for work. And then they took over because they had a strong work ethic. They took over the waterfront. They took over what was called the French market, which sold vegetables and fruits. And, and they basically dominated it until it was like the Sicilian market. So all of the Sicilian, hardworking Sicilian Americans that just wanted to pour their sweat out and earn a living, those were the sort of like the wave that the mafiosos rode in on. And then once those, those Sicilian Americans were in Louisiana dominating every industry you could think of because of their hard work ethic, everyone wanted to hire them. The mafiosos said, well, now we could have power. If we sort of mobilize the waterfront, if we mobilize the French market, and if we mobilize the bordellos, if we mobilize the casinos, we have now power and we could use it to, to gain political power because the politicians were all corrupt. And I go through that in the book as well. And there's a really interesting story. So, you know, that's around when the book gets into some really cool storytelling and we get all the intrigues, we get the blood and guts, you know, when they killed Chief Hennessy, mm -hmm. they whacked him out, you know, and then the, the Italians were lynched because of it, a lot of them, but they tiptoed around the mobsters, which is interesting. They lynched you know, these, these tuturus, you know, these shimonides that had nothing to do with the mafia, but they wouldn't touch the mafiosos, it, which is interesting. Yeah. That shows yeah. you the level of corruption that the mobsters had in Louisiana, that even for the crime that they had committed, which was to kill the chief, they didn't have to pay for it. They just dumped it off on some hardworking schleps. So that's interesting too. It is. Uh, yeah. You go into major detail into that situation because there, there was a lot that, that went into that. But I, I see what you're saying, though, like that's how they really got into coming over to New Orleans, I suppose. And then they started to kind of spread out and mm -hmm. and move over to New York and all the other places. And like, mm -hmm. what, what did you think? Like, like, because how long do you think it was before like Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel and Frank and Arnold oh, Rossi like, before them? Yeah, it's like they, they start arriving in New Orleans 
throughout the second half of the 1800s. So mostly, for the most part, they're mobilized by the end of the 1800s. And then all of a sudden, the New York, the New York Mafia was starting to creep up around that time too. But most of the power was still in New Orleans still. Then we shift to New York. And New York sort of like becomes the centerpiece when, you know, like pre-Lucky Luciano. Originally, it was Joe Mazzaria, mm-hmm. uh, Mar- Joe, uh, Giuseppe Maranzano. Those were like the original mafia bosses before Luciano. And then Luciano's on the rise. And he's coming up slowly but surely. And he's creeping up behind Mazzaria and Maranzano. And he sort of sees them as old school dons who had a, like a mentality that was stuck in the, the ice age. The, the, you know, Lu, Luciano goes, look, we're in America. I want to deal with blacks, Irish, Jews. I want to deal with everybody. And the old style Sicilians are going, no, we only want to deal with each other, with ourselves. And he goes, no, no, we're in America. You can't do that. If you want to get places in America, it's a melting pot. We're all here together. We need to work with each other. And they're like, no, 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 no. We stick with each other. So Luciano made a compromise. He says, if you want to be part of like a Borgata, you want to be part of a family, you got to be full-blooded Italian. That's how we, we you know, to initiate you. But, but if you want to work with us, you could be anything. And that's how the Italian mafia branched out and became so powerful because of that sort of like forward thinking of Luciano, who was like the, he was the visionary. And, and, and by, by the way, his schooling, his, his tutor was Arnold Rothstein who was an old time Jewish gangster who tutored all of these early mobsters, Frank Costello, uh, Albert Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Lucky Luciano. And they all, it's not like hype where you read, oh, Arnold Rothstein was their tutor. And you say, oh, what could it have been true? Well, these mobsters themselves attest to it. One after another would make comments and say, Rothstein taught me this. Rothstein taught me that. Rothstein showed me this. Rothstein funded my first illegal venture. Rothstein bankrolled my first scheme. You know, and time and again, and then they would say, Rothstein told us that you got to work with everybody. (laughs) And that's sort of like what Luciano then sort of took to the bank. And he made that like, I didn't care what you were. If you had, if you could make money in New York, Luciano was a friend of yours. And that's sort of like how the mafia operated when I was on the streets. You know, a lot of times stupid movies and stupid TV shows in the age of stupidity, we see a lot of times where they put paint like mafiosos and the mob is racist. Yeah. Okay. We all used harsh terms to describe each other. We weren't going to use like politically correct terms to describe each other. Obviously we're from the streets, but that doesn't mean we were racist because I dealt with everything and everyone, you name it. I dealt with that guy. You know, I had friends in the Spanish community. I had friends in the black community. I had friends in the Asian community and I did business with all of them. And anyone who brought me a tip was good to me. And if you were good to your word, and and let's say, for example, you were good to your word and I, and I shook your hand and you kept, you never, never broke your handshake with me. But an Italian I was dealing with always went back on his word, always shook his, always shook my hand and then went back on it and betrayed me. I'd rather hang out with the, with the black guy, the Asian guy, the Irish guy, the Spanish guy, than the Italian guy. So it was totally who you were when I was on the streets. You know, I mean, my crew was a perfect example. I had, I had Jews in my crew. I had a Syrian. I had Italians. I had an Irish guy. I had everything. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, we worked together and we all trusted each other. Do or die. Let's, let's you know, we, you know, this is like how it was. So, you know, that came from the Luciano age. That, that's Luciano started that era where he partnered with Myelansky from the Jews. He partnered with Bumpy Johnson in Harlem and he was close friends with all of them. And now they have that gangster of Harlem show where they try to say, oh, the Italians are racist. They couldn't get along with Bumpy Johnson. Bumpy Johnson's wife, his own wife, go out there and read the memoir. It's a great memoir. His own wife wrote a memoir and she said that Lucky Luciano was one of my husband's absolute truest friends. And I quoted in the book, that's coming from Bumpy Johnson's wife. So, you know, you know, I mean, you could take all that Hollywood crap and flush it down the toilet bowl because it ain't true. That's true. That's Bumpy Johnson's wife who said that. So, and that's how we got along in my time, you know, and we all, by the way, we all dated everybody's sisters, uh, you know, and my sister, their sisters, nobody cared. Come on. You know, I mean, it's just exaggerated on movies and stuff. Exaggerated bullshit. It's the sell stuff. You know, it's not right. But I pointed that out in the book. 
You know, I mean, look, it, again, we didn't talk the best way. We referred to each other through the most derogatory names, but to each other's faces because it wasn't taken that way. So it's a different time. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't <laughs> taken that way. Now everybody's sensitive. But back then, nobody took it. Somebody called, hey, Guinea, if it's my friend, you could say that to me. If you weren't my friend, we have a problem. But if you were my friend and you said, yo, WAP, who cares? It's my buddy. I love him. Hey, what's up? So, you know, I mean. I do recall from your book, though, when you talked about Bumpy Johnson's wife, like that part in that book, I was like, yeah, that's very interesting because I didn't know about the whole relationship with him and Bumpy Johnson at all, like Lucky Luciano and him. But Lucky Luciano, there was like a backstory, like he had to wait to work with Bumpy Johnson before uh, which uh, was a Jewish gangster that had to die first. And then they started working together, right? Yeah, Dutch Schultz. Doug, they, okay. you know, Dutch Schultz sort of like mobilized all of the policy banks in Harlem, the tickets. You know, you used to bet the ticket. You bet the policy bank. You win your number, your three numbers. You know, you bet a dollar, you win 600 bucks or $1,000 sometimes, whatever it was. And Dutch Schultz mobilized all that in Harlem. So Bumpy Johnson wanted to clip Dutch Schultz. So he went to Luciano and he said, look, if I get rid of Dutch Schultz, you know, you want to partner with me. Luciano gave him a wink and says, look, I'm on it. I'll get back to you at some point in the near future. Let me take care of things. So Bumpy Johnson said, sure, do what you got to do. And Bumpy Johnson was a lot younger than Luciano. You got to give the guy credit. Tough as nails and smart. You know, one of the smartest gangsters. I got mad respect for him as a gangster. You know, I'm, I'm a civilian now. I'm, I'm, I'm a legitimate guy. But as a gangster, you got to have mad respect for Bumpy Johnson. He goes to Luciano the minute Dutch Schultz is clipped. And he, ca- he tells Luciano, we're in business. And Luciano says, look, this is what I want you to do. We got all the numbers mobilized. Dutch Schultz did it for us already. My Borgata took it over. You got the blacks in Harlem that could sort of like organize and make sure no problems happen and keep things going. We'll partner. And they made a deal. And Luciano said Bumpy Johnson was a hard negotiator, but they loved each other. And once again, they became tight friends. And Bumpy's own wife said that he was my one of my husband's truest friends. And at some point, I think Luciano mailed him a chess set, Bumpy Johnson, like yeah. as a gift. They and know. I don't know if it was sort of like, because they used to play chess together, you know, like me, meaning chess, like in street talk, you know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. making different moves with each other, or they just like to play real, real chess. I don't know. Whatever the case was, he mailed him a chess set. So, Damn. you know, which was interesting too. But, right. you know, once again, that was Luciano was with Bumpy Johnson. Bumpy Johnson was gone, gone by the time Chin Giganti, who's the Italian guy, gangster of Holland portrays in that show. He, Bump, Chin Giganti had nothing to do with Bumpy Johnson. That's They made that. It's all made up. You know, these people who just watched Hollywood shit too and just nod along. I mean, come on, man. Wake up. Go pick up a book. Buy my book. <laughs> no kidding. That, that's where all the real information is, man. Yeah, and I mean, all these uh, books and histories yeah. and documents, everything. Yeah, different, different thing. You know, different, yeah. different thing. Mm-hmm. Well, with Lucky as well, in your book, you made it a clear point as well that he became an informant and that he was working with the government on some level. But well, he was. Yeah, Lucky, throughout his life, Lucky Luciano did. And I pointed out, nobody ever points it out. Everybody wants to put Lucky Luciano on a pedestal. What I do in my book is I call a spade a spade. If you deserve credit, you get credit. If you deserve to 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 get, you know, if something you did is below board, I want to put that in too. And let the reader make opinion about the person. Let the reader decide. You like him, you don't like him. Here's all the facts. So Lucky Luciano was an incredible gangster in the sense that he created the commission. He brought that sort of forward thinking to the mob. He created like the five families or helped create them. But, but. Whenever he was in a tight spot, he would snitch. And and I point that out in the book. I'm not giving him a pass. You know, I had I, I had a couple of people go, oh, man, how do you say that about Lucky Luciano? How do I say the truth? You don't want me to say the truth? You know, we're going to sweep, sweep some of it under the rug? You got to call a spade a spade. If this is what the guy did and the evidence is there, I put it out there. And you make your own judgment. I walked away liking Luciano for all he did, but despising him for every time he ratted. You know, so like, you know, you, you make your own decision. You know, I mean, he did start the mafia. You know, it's almost like if you read a biography about, let's say, George Washington, founding right. father, first president of the United States, and it's three or 400 pages and everything George Washington ever, ever did was great. If he sneezed, his saliva watered a plant and it grew. You know, like <laughs> he never made a mistake, this guy. 
I want to see a biography that tells me all the good he did and the bad he did. Let me walk away and decide if I like him or not. And that's what I wanted to do in my book. And I did it with each character that I portray in my book. Call a spade a spade, show the person for who they are, and then you could decide. Nobody's perfect. We all know that. You know, everybody does things. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has, you know, but we have enough evidence there. And it's, and it's interesting to put it in. I put it in, let the reader decide. I see why. I, I can completely understand why. Because you want to have people understand from both sides, the good and the bad, what, mm-hmm. whatever it may be, from mm-hmm. working with the, helping with the government or anything like that. Like, Because it, it is in there. I mean, it, it's mm-hmm. in the past we have heard all kinds of different things, of course, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. have been reported. But I, I could see why you would put want to make that point very clear with each and, character that you talk and, about. And look, Adrian, I'm, in one instance, he partners with the government, Luciano does to save the waterfront during World War II. So that was, to me, a good thing. You know, he partnered with the U.S. Naval Intelligence uh, to secure the waterfront. The waterfront, just to give your your listeners a little bit bit of a backstory here, World War II breaks out, and we're fighting the Japanese on one front and the Germans on the other. And the Germans, at some point, send Nazi subs to the coast of New York. They're, They're caught off the coast of New York, a couple different submarines. And... At some point or another, a ship burns in the port of New York. And the Navy was curious if it was sabotage. And even though they ruled that it wasn't, they wanted to secure the docks because we're sending shiploads of of, um, supplies and soldiers to Europe every day. We can't have the ports unsecure. So they approach the mob, knowing the mob controls the waterfront. And the guy they had first approached was Joe Sox Lanza, who controlled the South Street Seaport and most of the waterfront. He goes, listen. I'll do whatever I could for you, but you got to talk to my boss, Lucky Luciano. He's in jail right now. So the Navy then sets up a meeting with an attorney to talk to Luciano and ask him if he'll give the word to secure the waterfront. And Luciano sends word back to the Navy. It's the least I could do for my country. So even the Italian mafiosos, who obviously every day went out and committed another crime, love their country because this country, America, gave them the opportunity to be who they were. You know, the, you know, in another country, they might have been stamped out if it was a tyranny. You know, mm-hmm. the, the tyrant says, you know what? Kill Lucky Luciano, hang him from the gallows or chop his head off and throw it in the South Street uh, uh, Sea, you know, by the seaport. Throw, throw his head in there. In, in America, democracy, laws, you know, protected individual rights. The mafia could get a lot, away with a lot. So they love this country. So he said, I'm happy to protect it. I wouldn't want to be with Mussolini in Italy. You know, that was mm-hmm. sort of Germany's ally was, was the Italians. By then... Mussolini had had sided with the German army. Uh, and basically the Italian Americans didn't like Mussolini because he was a fascist. And the mob in Italy didn't like Mussolini because Mussolini stamped out the mob in Italy. So the, you know, where they were they were still running things in America. So they did everything they can, the mob did. And I go through that as well during World War II to protect the waterfront and to basically become the roving eyes of this of the entire uh, eastern seaboard where they acted like lighthouses. Anything they saw was reported back to them. When the ship captains would come in from sea, they would immediately go talk to the mobsters who would report back to Joe Sox Lanza, who would tell Naval Intelligence what he saw out there. So, I mean, that's like sort of like, so that's an instance where when Lucky Luciano did partner with the government, it was for a damn good reason. Mm -hmm. And I see like with your book as well, you made sure to make, it known like as well with Bugsy Siegel, Meyer Lansky, and Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. Like they were key players as well, but they were all working together. They were all cool with each other for the most part. And then, of course, things change over time. But uh, mm-hmm. like, 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 but that kind of wraps up like to where your your end of your book is. It kind of leaves off like them having meetings, like commission meetings and stuff, mm-hmm. and Vegas growing, and mm-hmm. which we, you know, there was a lot of detail in that as well. So again, mm-hmm. it's in the book if you want to read more about that. But like. I'm curious to understand, like, what uh, what's part two going to be like? Like, what, what what can you discuss about this? Um, part one is the rise of the mafia. So it's the first sort of like hundred years, roughly hundred years, eighteen sixties Sicily up until nineteen nineteen sixty America, and in that hundred years, you see the rise of the mafia. They corrupt politicians. We went through that. We went through how they started Las Vegas. We went through how they started Q, uh, uh, the the big hotel casinos in Cuba. 
We went through how they sort of reached out into California. Obviously, I can only touch on a lot of these things because it would be 20 volumes otherwise. It, as it is, it's three volumes. But I get into it a little. Uh, in California, how they ran the movie, uh, the movie unions, etc. So we go through the labor unions in Manhattan, the Garment Center, how they infiltrated the Garment Center, how they infiltrated the garment industry. Now, volume two picks up where the mafia has never had anybody that really came after them. No real sort of like powerful concentrated attack coming at them. No knockout blow. And then all of a sudden, they help put John Kennedy in office, the 35th president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy appoints his brother, Robert Francis Kennedy, as his attorney general, which makes him the biggest law enforcement officer in the land. And once Robert Kennedy became AG, attorney general, he said, I'm going after the mob with everything I got. And that sort of begins book two. And how the mafia deals with that and how they face their first major obstacle is the big part of the beginning of book two. Then we get into the Gallo War, Gallo versus Profaci, uh, Joe Colombo. We get into Joe Bonanno and the Bonanno War. We get into, eventually we get into um, uh, Johnny Roselli and guys who were working with the CIA to try to kill Castro and how they ended up. Roselli, for example, ends up cut in half and stuffed in a barrel. We get into um, eventually the rise of John Gotti and, and his feud with Paul Castellano. And that's volume two and much more. So there's a lot in volume two. Um, but once again, too, I want to make sure your listeners understand, pick up the book. It's not as academic as you think. It's a little academic in the beginning, but then we get into sort of the gory details of storytelling and blood and guts of mafia storytelling and the intrigues, which is what me as a reader interests me most is the intrigues. I love intrigues. I love to learn about them. I love to no longer be part of them. At one time I was part of them, no longer, mm -hmm. but I love the whole, right. the whole intrigues is what that gets me. I like that part. And I do, sometimes I'll explain to you if Genovese was intriguing against Costello, what he was thinking, what he was up to. And long before anybody, like if you usually just, the writers jump into, they had a beef together and then Genovese sends a hitman and shoots Costello. I got into the deep intrigues that went, that led up to that day. And I want to make sure that you know exactly what was behind it when that bullet goes off. When that bullet is fired at Costello, I want you to know everything that went into that before it happened. And I, to me, that's that's how I like to read stuff. And that's what I tried to do. The last thing I did was I debunked a lot of myths. There's a lot of myths people heard, as you saw, time and again, you know, the same author will repeat, you know, different authors rather for like decades will repeat the same story. And I'm like, this could have never happened. That's bullshit. Where'd they get this from? And then I'll dig deep and find out where the story sort of originated from and then explain to the reader why this could have never happened and then explain to the reader what probably did happen so that you understand, as I do, how to think like a mob guy. And that's all I want the reader to do, walk away from it the way I think. You'll see then for yourself when you read something else, this could have never happened or this definitely happened. You'll know because you read it and you understood it because I broke it down, the different components. I did. I use deductive thinking to show you. And I, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I liked about your book and the way that you did it was because you you detailed it. Like what what like you say, Frank Costello was thinking when he got shot or like when what led up to uh, Vince in the chin shooting him and stuff like. But you went into detail about all that. And so that's what I thought. I, I do like that, too, how you expand on that, because it's like we know, like, OK, well, Vito or, you know, Vito Genovese was behind the shooting or whatever. But why? Like we want to know why, and so you did that, and like that, that, that not, and that's just in that instance. But you did on multiple levels as mm -hmm. well. So I, I just wanted to uh, really tell you again that I enjoyed the book. I left a great review on Amazon. So again, for the people watching, just be sure to go check out Lewis's book. It'll be in the video description as well. And there's it's going to be a part. It's going to be a three part series altogether. So one is out. Two is two and three are done. Right, but you're just. It's just got to have a time lapse, you think, Lewis, or what's the... Well, two, you could pre-order two now. It's, okay. it's I think two is up on Amazon now. You could pre-order yeah. it. I, I urge everyone to pre-order it, um, and it should be out by the end of this year, okay. um, and you'll probably be the first to get it then, but hopefully you enjoy one, uh, read one. Anybody could feel free to drop me an email. You have any questions or whatever, take me some time sometimes to get back to you, but I will. Um, at, you know, so... 
so far, so good. Everybody's really, really enjoying it. And I enjoyed writing it. It just took the shit out of me, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Bro. Beat me up, but it's done. I'm happy. I know. You got to be at a good place right now to where you're just dropping the, the content of all the work that you put in and just doing interviews and, you know, racking up uh, the views and stuff, just trying to get your, your message out there because it's what, it's what your podcast is about, right? Invest exactly. in yourself. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's what you do. I, I urge everybody, whatever your thing is, you know, invest, put the time in and you'll be good. At, you'll be good at it. Just put the time in and do your thing and do it the best you can. And don't ever, you know, don't ever, don't ever let yourself go shy on what you think your full abilities are. And, and that's basically why, why I like your podcast, bro. It's really, really good because that's what it's about. And that's, this is what I did. Invested seven or eight years, you invest in yourself and, you know, you invest in things that also too have, I guess, sort of like a, a, a positive effect on others, you know? So I like doing something where others could gain from it. Others could, you could teach people something, which is cool. You know, you, it's not just a self-centered thing where, you know, you know, some, some people do things to me that businesses I would never go into. Mm -hmm. right. It's just to get rich or something. And it's just to, I don't know how much of an investment it is other than in your bank account. You know, I mean, but but there there are things you could do. Pick something where you're investing maybe in your bank account, but also investing in yourself and doing something that's positive for the world and in the world. Yeah. No, I agree. And that's where I was going to head into. That's what I was leaning into was that the reason I brought you on is because you're a damn good redemption story. You were involved with the mafia. You did your time after going to prison for a number of years. You educated yourself and became a damn good author and did all kinds of different great stuff. And you've been out for quite a number of years now and you've really changed your life around. And you really, I mean, from the book, man, and everything, the way you carry yourself, the way you speak, you're very well educated and smart about things. And that's what I want to show people. Yeah, your book, everything, it's great. But on top of that, you got a great redemption story. And that's that's why I was like, damn, we got to bring Lou on for another part, too, because he's just, you know, very motivational for people. And people really enjoyed the book and your backstory and everything that has come along with to where you are today, man. So thank you, Lou. I really appreciate you taking out another, you know, more time to come on my show again. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Yeah. Lots, lots of luck with your show. Keep growing. Yeah. Keep up the great work. Thank you, man. Lewis has got a very powerful amount of knowledge about the mafia. He also got some really great redemption story. He made a decision in his life that he was going to get away from the mafia life, and he stuck with it. Anything is possible with the help of God. The overall message for this episode is anybody can invest in themselves, and Lewis is a damn prime example of that. Lewis's book will be in the video description below. Also, please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos like this and at the end of this interview a playlist will pop up of all my other mafia related interviews if you enjoyed this one i know damn well you'll enjoy the other ones on there so thank you again so much for watching and of course we'll see you on the next one